All right, hello architects, and welcome back to another video on building serverless applications on AWS. It has been a while before Christmas since the last video. Whoa, I am super excited to get back creating content now. I have some stuff going on, but we are here again, ready to talk about serverless.NET, Java, and probably some Rust over the next few weeks. So keep your eyes peeled. But today I wanna to talk about something outside of a specific programming language. This is something more conceptual and it's something that I've changed my mind on quite a bit over the last six to 12 months. A pretty dramatic change of mind, in fact. I used to be a pretty militant about the fact that a single API endpoint should map to a single Lambda function. You've got 10 endpoints on your API, well then that should be 10 separate Lambda functions. Everything's single purpose. Lambda functions are meant to be single purpose, right? Well, maybe not always. And I had a really fantastic conversation at reInvent last year with Benjamin Pyle about this. If you don't follow Benjamin Pyle on Twitter, go and check him out. He's talking about all the Rust things at the minute. It's amazing. So when you're building APIs with Lambda, one of the things you've got to deal with, one of the biggest problems you'll typically face is the old cold start. Yeah, the dreaded cold start. Ha <laughs> ha. And that's because synchronous workloads are latency sensitive, right? If you've got a 700, 800, 900, one and a half second response to your API, well, your users are going to notice that. They're going to see that. Asynchronous processing, unless you're doing something really crazy, typically not as much of a problem because if it takes a second to start up and then pull a message from a queue, well, the message on the queue doesn't really mind. It's just sat there waiting for you. Over 70% of you watching these videos are not yet subscribed to this channel. I'm honestly, it's amazing to have you all here watching the video, enjoying the content. It would mean so much to me if you were to like and subscribe this video. I'd drop a comment in the chat. I'd love hearing back from you. It's one of the reasons why I do this is hearing from you, hearing what you think of the videos and helping me drive the content forward. Was brought really far forward in the videos I had planned because I had four or five separate people reach out to me on social media, on YouTube comments, asking this very question. When do I use single purpose handlers? When do I use web frameworks on Lambda? So feedback, like, subscribe, comment, and I can keep making video that matters to all of you. Back to the video. So when you start thinking about building APIs on Lambda and you're dealing with cold starts, and let's imagine you're building a single purpose function. So you've got your API here. This is your API. And let's imagine your API has got three endpoints, okay? Requests come into your API and they get routed out to the respective endpoints. And let's say for the purposes of this video that you have one request, one request, one request. These requests happen to each endpoint concurrently, which I realize is very rarely the case. But let's imagine a user submits an order, then they get the status of the order, and then they update the status of the order. For example, three separate endpoints. And let's imagine you have a 500 millisecond cold start. Okay, so you've got a 500 millisecond cold start here, and then the actual request processing takes 50 milliseconds for the sake of maths. And let's imagine that all of these Lambda functions have the same 500 millisecond cold start, 50 millisecond actual processing time. So this gives you 1650 milliseconds total time, 1650 milliseconds. And that's because for each individual endpoint, you have to have a cold start because there's no Lambda environment available. Let's compare that to the alternative. Let's compare that to running an entire web application on Lambda. Something like ASP.NET, Spring Boot, Axum or Actix in the Rust world. So you've got your API and you've got your single Lambda function. So every single request that comes in and hits your API is going to get routed onto that same Lambda function. Then all the route into the individual endpoint is handled by the web framework itself or something like the Lambda web adapter if you're using Lambda web adapter. This gets very, very interesting. It's interesting because let's imagine your cold start is slower. So you had a 500 millisecond cold start originally. Let's say you've now got, I don't know, a one second cold start because you're running an entire API. And then your request processing two takes 50 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds because you've got the one, two, three API calls called one after the other. Now, obviously you're all intelligent people, so you'll have really quickly done this maths and worked out that you've actually got 1,150 milliseconds of total duration. So although this initial number is lower, so although this initial number here is higher, your total overall response for your all your endpoints is faster. 
And this is the really interesting thing with this pattern, because although your cold starts will typically be slower when you're running an entire web framework on Lambda, and if you're using things like Axum and Actix in Rust, it's almost negligible, really. But if you're using .NET and ASP.NET, Spring Boot and Java, your cold start might be slower, but typically you're going to see less cold starts. I've seen up to 75% less cold starts working in this manner. So that might lead you to think, how exactly do I go about implementing this? How do I actually make this happen? So I'll flick over to an example here. This is some CDK code written in TypeScript. And um, this is for an example application I've got on um, GitHub. I can put the link in the description. It's a Rust-based application, an implementation actually of the Zero to Production Rust book written by the fantastic Luca Palmieri. It's probably the best programming book I've ever read. If you're learning in Rust, then go and check it out. It'll be appearing somewhere around here. No sponsorship or anything like that. It's just an amazing book. Uh, anyway, so if you are actually thinking about doing this, you want to route all of your requests to Lambda, it's actually really, really simple. When you define your API, whether that's an API Gateway HTTP API or an API Gateway REST API, all you need to do is add a single resource to that API. And that is a resource that has a very particular name. And that is... Curly brace, proxy plus, close curly brace. And what this tells API Gateway to do is to forward all of the requests that hit this API onto the exact same Lambda function. And you can see I'm building a Lambda integration here using a Lambda function that's defined up here somewhere. This is my Rust-based application. I'm deploying this as a Docker image for some reason that we don't need to get into right now. And this is as simple as it is. So now every single request that hits this API gateway is going to go to this same Lambda function. And this will give you that same pattern where you might see a slightly higher cold start initially, but you're typically going to see less cold starts over time. And you can do this using something like the Lambda web adapter, which I had a video on just, uh, just for Christmas, I think. I'll put a link somewhere again floating around. Or if you're using something like ASP.NET in .NET, you can use the Amazon Lambda ASP Net Core Server NuGet package to add this functionality natively to ASP.NET. So you can just pick up an ASP.NET application, drop that into Lambda. Or if you're using Spring Boot, you can use the serverless Java container. Again, there's another video on my channel about deploying Spring Boot into Lambda, and you can use that same pattern. And whilst initially you might think this isn't a good pattern, when you think about this idea of a Lambda lift, it actually might not be as bad as you think. Now, one thing I'm not proposing that you do is deploy an entire big, horrible, monolithic application into Lambda. If you've got tens, hundreds of different endpoints, then that's probably not a right fit. And that's because any work you need to do in your startup of your application, whether that's the size of your application bundle that's being downloaded, or the work to actually set up your application, to start up your application. Well, of course, that is going to directly impact your cold start time. So whilst you could run a API in Lambda, apply the same heuristics you would use if you were building microservices and try and keep these minimal pieces of functionality. If your application takes orders, products, payments, and stock, for example, you might have four separate Lambda functions, one for all the order endpoints, one for all the payment endpoints, one for all the stock endpoints, one for all the product endpoints. Break them down like that. You can also get a little bit more specific as you start to optimize this. Another really other pattern that I really like, and this is what opens up if you're using something like API Gateway, is that you have your API Gateway here, and that API Gateway is using that proxy plus endpoint to forward the majority of your requests to a single Lambda function. You've got your entire web framework running in here with all your different routes and endpoints. And then actually you think, hmm, I've got one endpoint on this API that I need to really, really optimize. At cold start, it just needs to be incredibly quick all the time, no matter what, cold start or not. In ASP.NET, that might mean using something like native AOT to natively compile your .NET application so that the cold start times are really, really snappy. So what you can do is you might actually just break off that single endpoint. So now you've got, you've still got your proxy plus endpoint, which will take priority when the request comes into API Gateway, but you might also have a slash order and maybe that's a get endpoint. So you, you specify this more specific route in API Gateway. So if the request comes in for order get, it will be routed to this Lambda function here and you can guarantee every time cold start, not a cold start, whatever, this might be a say, 300 millisecond cold start and you've still got maybe 10 milliseconds of processing because you've really well optimized this function. This is just something that you need to be performant no matter what. And then the rest of your requests are still going off to your entire web application 
taking the cold starts that you need. So you can get into these really interesting patterns where you can optimize really specifically. But for a lot of use cases, you just stick with this entire web framework on Lambda. This gives you an awful lot of flexibility because now you're running an entire web application inside Lambda. You could just pick that up and drop that application somewhere else. The Amazon Lambda ASP NetCore server NuGet package that I talked about, at least in the .NET world, it's context aware. So you could run the exact same ASP Net application on Lambda, on ECS Fargate, on AppRunner. If you really, really want to, you could run it on Kubernetes, but yeah, Kubernetes, there. So it's flexible. It also gives you a really good developer experience. Running an entire web framework inside Lambda means you keep that familiar experience where you can just start up your application on localhost. Maybe you run some Docker containers next to it to simulate things like DynamoDB local, or maybe you're using Postgres or another database provider. You can run all these tests locally, interact with your API locally, and then you just bundle it up and drop it into Lambda, and it'll run inside Lambda however you choose to do that. Of course, as with everything in software, it always, always depends, which I realize feels like a bit of a cop-out at this point. But look at your specific workload. Don't just discount the idea of running an entire web framework inside Lambda before you've actually looked at the data. What I always, always recommend people do when they get started is to start with something simple. Take an entire application, a full web framework, whichever one it is you're familiar with, Flask, Express, ASP.NET, Spring, Axiomatix, pick them up and drop them into Lambda. And don't just hit that test button in the console just once. I know it's a wonderful button to go and hit and you're like, yay, Lambda. Run that multiple times. Run some actual load through your Lambda function. Don't just hit it once and think, ah, oh, cold starts. They're never going to work. Run some real world load and look at the total picture. Look at the number of cold starts that you see. Look at how what percentage of your requests are actually cold starts and use that to make a really conscious decision. And if you need to, absolutely step out into single purpose handlers. Or maybe you end up with a mix of both. You end up with the majority of your endpoints using a web framework and some of your endpoints broken out into really, really stupidly well-optimized Lambda functions. So this is something I just wanted to set up as a precursor to some of the Rust content I'm going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Like I say, I've built a serverless implementation of Luca Palmieri's fantastic book, Zero to Production Rust, and I'm going to be talking about that in the next few weeks. Rust really caught my eye last year. And after Werner Vogel's keynote at reInvent last year, talking about sustainability and the frugal architect, and I'm really starting to double down on Rust. I'm really starting to see the benefits of using Rust on Lambda, both from a performance, a safety, a memory allocation, a sustainability. There's all these different reasons why I think Rust is amazing. So that's what I'm going to cover for the next few weeks. I'm going to walk through a production-ready serverless Rust application, covering things like configuration management, how to set up your project, observability, using open telemetry and sending trace data to an open telemetry backend. All these things are going to be covered in the next few weeks with some perfectly amazing Rust content. Super excited to see you all. Super excited to go through this content with you. And I will see you all in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.